Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche. I just couldn't be more delighted. My face hurts when you're here because I just <laughs> smile more and I smile harder. It's always uh, nice to be here, Shannon. I'm so happy to be back. Thrill. And for people who don't know who might be tuning into us for the first time, Dr. Doreen Grampiche is a true expert in the field of autism. I believe the preeminent expert in autism in our time, in any time. Uh, I don't. I have met a lot of people over the last 14 years. Um, 10 of which I've been covering autism and interviewed a lot of people and I don't know anyone who knows more than you do and I don't know Thank I haven't you. met anyone who cares more than you do. Thank you so much. And I also uh, it's very kind. You're, you're wicked smart as they say in Boston. <laughs> She's wicked smart and um, uh, you are I think the the person that I when I think about trying to be a better person and being better at perspective taking, I think, what would Dr. Grampiche do? That's because you're way so good too at that. nice of you, uh, Well, I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean it. So, because I do think, uh, especially within the autism community, you are so good at perspective taking and looking at it from the point of view of the individual who's on the spectrum, which is very important. Um, looking at it from, from the perspective of the parent, which a lot of people only look at it that way and other people won't look at it that way and I think yeah. it's a valid perspective that has to be looked at but you look at it from the whole family the siblings you look at it from the practitioners the people who are working with these individuals and and try to figure out how can we all come to the table and do what's right for these individuals and that's right. an amazing right. thing well, I thank you I say it behind your back all the time that you're the real deal and that I would follow you into a burning building I love you thank you so much <laughs> I love you more <laughs> there we go um, but having said all that, we like to give a disclaimer at the start of the show that there is no expert in any field, but especially in autism, that could give individual specific advice in this particular format. That's right. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be right, right? Uh, because they don't have an opportunity to be with the individual and really get to know them. And this is not a one-size-fits-all field. Definitely. So um, Dr. Grampiche will be answering your questions, but keep in mind that she's going to answer them in a general format. To, with the thought to help you to get information to take you to the next step, which might be having a, an expert sit down with you or the individual. So keep that in mind, but I know families write in all the time for how grateful they are. I hope you, one of our viewers sent lovely gifts to us. I sent I it upstairs see, to you. That's so nice from Wasn't Ireland, Wasn't that the sweetest right? thing? Yes. Yeah, that's so nice. I wanted to have a chance to say thank you. That's so thoughtful. And I have not had a chance to, to send a thank you, but, but we, I was so moved by it. Absolutely. I just thought that was so Absolutely. delightful. We got and, delicious Cadbury chocolates, and there was also a very beautiful silver ornament in the package. Thank you very much. That's really kind of it you, and I'm really so glad fun. that we're able to help you in any way we can. Yes, yes. It's so, uh, you do not need to send gifts, let me be clear about yes, that, yes. but it was so meaningful. And it's so thoughtful to us when we find out that we've been able to help somebody in any way. Um, you know, I'm just the, the switchboard here, but it means a lot to me to know that we're, we're getting something done, and I know how much it means to you when people let you know that you've made a difference. Definitely, especially if they're so far away, you know, that yeah. that means we have some ability to be effective for families in Ireland. That's amazing to me. I, You know, technology is such a wonderful thing, and I try to remind Honestly. myself of that on all the days that it's not working for me Honestly. in the right way that it, you know, what an amazing time we live in. Okay, but we're going to get to questions here because that's the important thing today. So somebody had written in and said, do you have any tips for aggression in yeah. a nonverbal autistic four-year-old? Right. So, you know, and this is uh, one of those situations Well, I will try to give some advice right now, but I think that if you have a child who is aggressive, you should seek out help from a professional. I see Gabe coming in and I'm wondering <laughs> he, if we're okay. No, no, we're totally <laughs> we're okay. okay. He, he adjusts, so okay, don't great. mind him. Okay, great. <laughs> so um, I do think that it would be helpful to have help from a professional because handling aggression in your child is not an easy thing. But let's talk about why a four-year-old would have aggression. Um, it's funny, I just did a, a sort of a FaceTime kind of evaluation for a family in Spain. Oh. And we were talking about their child and they ran through all these various symptoms and this was a, a seven-year-old and they had a, um, all kinds of challenging behaviors, including aggression. And um, it was very eye-opening to them when I told them, you know, aggression or 
uh, any of these challenging behaviors really, they are, they are not part of the symptomology of autism. They are a side effect of having autism. They're the result of not being able to communicate appropriately. And if you think about it, any one of us, when we are um, like angered by something or upset or uh, worried or uh, you know in any way disappointed or sad or whatever it is, um, and if we're not able to communicate that, what do we do? We yell, we tantrum for all practical yeah. purposes. Um, you know, th those who haven't matured well even will phys have physical altercations. So aggression is a form of communication. All challenging behaviors are a form of communication and they have to be seen as such because the key to figuring out how to get rid of challenging behaviors is you have to figure out what the reason is for the behavior and it's hard because when you have a child who's hitting you let's say or biting spitting whatever form of aggression your your reaction is not to calmly try to figure out why is he doing this your reaction is either to like be punitive about it or avoid it or give in right. which is what we generally do so uh, the important thing is that to find out the reason or to figure out the reason in, in ABA terminology, we call that the function of the behavior. The function of the behavior is, is the reason the behavior is occurring. And generally speaking, it's, I, I find it very easy um, for myself and I think it would be helpful for parents if you think of hu generally we, every behavior we do is for two reasons and it's it's to avoid something or if it's it's to gain access to something so uh, what do we like to avoid what do our children type try to avoid usually they're trying to avoid demands like go do something so they're trying to avoid that or or locations uh, going to school for instance mm -hmm. or people you know they're trying to avoid some situation sometimes a sensory thing the, like a so, sound a hundred percent sometimes it's a sound or a light or something mm -hmm. that's really disturbing to them um, and what are they trying to gain access to uh, those would be anything like attention a toy a certain food um, you know, back uh, the backyard so I can run around, whatever it is. So it's always a combination, it's one or the other or a combination of avoidance and trying to gain. So when your child is aggressive, you have to ask yourself if they could communicate, what would they actually be saying? And most of the time the child would be saying, can I have something? Or no, I don't want to do that. And because the child can't communicate that, instead they will aggress. Now, what happens when they aggress uh, is also very important. That's the consequence to the behavior. And usually, when a child aggresses, what happens is everybody around that child pretty much backs off and gives in. That's very, very common. Just think about it. Like, if a child aggresses in the classroom, what do we do? We generally will take the child for a walk outside. Well. What if the child, uh, their intent, their, their, the reason for aggressing was they didn't want to be in the classroom? By taking them out of the classroom, what they learn is aggression is effective. It works. It gets me what I want. Let's say a child wants a toy and they hit another child and they get the toy. Getting the toy is rewarding, right? So what it does is it teaches the child in their head, that was pretty effective. All I have to do is hit. So that is what maintains aggression, is that it works. And in ABA, what we do is we make sure that we're, it doesn't work anymore. Aggression doesn't actually get what the child was intending to get. So let's say the child is trying to avoid a situation and they aggress. We make sure that they don't get out of that situation. So for instance, if I place a demand, if I tell the child, um, you know, uh, it's time for dinner and the child's trying to avoid coming to dinner and they aggress and tantrum and all that sort of stuff, I will make sure that I still get my child over to dinner. I will bring the child over and sit them down at dinner and just ignore the aggression because it's important for the child to learn the aggression is ineffective. Um, instead, though, I have to give my child now another way to communicate, right? So the way to do that is to teach communication. Some children are nonverbal, that's okay. We start with nonverbal ways of communicating anyway. 
and those would be things like sign or PEX, picture exchange communication system, or just touching an icon to communicate, the very basic form of a PEX program. Um, some children are verbal and we teach them verbally. Some of the children who are nonverbal later become verbal and we switch it over to a verbal form of communication. But that's where ABA becomes super important because when you're teaching your child that their current way of communicating doesn't work, you must teach them also a way that does work. So let's say a child wants a, a food item or a drink and what they're used to doing is hitting to get your attention so that they can get the object they want. If you're going to ignore that, you still need the child to have some other way of communicating Absolutely. that they want what they want. And that has to happen almost simultaneously or even first because we never want to ignore a child and then not have any idea what they want because that challenging behavior might dissipate. Another one will creep in. So that's the answer to, to aggression in nonverbal children. What I would recommend for you is, um, a, a lot of what I said is very simple because I've been doing it for years and years. It's very, very hard when it's your child and you don't have an ABA background. So what I recommend very much is if you go on a website for Institute for Behavior Training, IBT, and the website I believe is ibehavioraltraining.com ibehavioraltraining.com and there you will find uh, small short modules of training that we've prepared for parents and you can go in there and specifically look for tips for dealing with aggression and the module will train you on how to manage behaviors how to handle challenging difficult behaviors it'll teach you all the basics of ABA I would suggest you spend as much time as you can learning more about these different techniques that you can use um, and not only will you learn how to manage behavior but you can also then learn other things like you can learn how to teach your child and how to uh, get your child to socialize and and get them out there and lots of very useful things on IBT's website absolutely absolutely and and honestly you know as a parent this all sounds like, I don't know, uh, you know, like it's very far away from you when you first hear about this, right. but they actually graph when, you know, your child's behaviors and, and their challenging behaviors, and it can be, you know, steeply going up. And then they will start to graph when they are teaching your child some form of communication. And there's this thing that happens on the graph, and I always call it the magic X. Yes. Because as they teach the communication, the challenging behavior goes right, down. Right, right. And that is when your life gets good. Yes. Is when you see the magic X on the graph, it's like the first breath that a parent takes and goes, oh, right. this is doable. Right. My child can learn. I can learn. And, you know, we're cutting off the blood supply of this behavior that wasn't working for us. Absolutely. We're just cutting it off, and then, but we're making sure that we're teaching them something else. The magic X comes, and I'm telling you, you can, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. I never used to like graphs. I'm not a data person. I should be, but I'm not. But you feel the stress level go down in everyone, in the child, in the parent, when that magic X appears. Definitely. And everybody goes, wow this works and this is amazing definitely and mm -hmm. and you make a really good point this is one of the toughest things for parents i think because you know in the beginning when you start to like for aggression for instance as you either block it or ignore it right it will get worse before it goes away that's actually called an extinction burst it's a it's a specific thing that happens where the behavior gets worse before it decreases and goes away. And the reason for that is, if you think about it mentally, the child is thinking, wait a minute, this aggression used to work in the past. Why aren't they giving me what I want? I'm going to do it more. I'm going to do it louder. I'm going to be more aggressive. And, be, and they, because they think by being more aggressive, they're going to get the attention or the object or avoid what they wanted to avoid. And when, when they don't, that's when it's, uh, it's like an aha moment for the child. We're like, oh, that isn't working, working anymore. anymore. Wait a minute, this communication thing is working. Exactly. And so I'm going to use this. It's easier, and I get my way, and yeah. I don't have to have a 20-minute tantrum. 
And parents tend to freak when the extinction burst comes because they go, this isn't working, it's when so in scary. fact it's, it's the so sign that it is it working. It is working, that's right. And the example that I always give for extinction burst is uh, <laughs> something that I actually did. You know, I walk into our bathroom every day and I flick on the light and the light comes on. And, right? and I, so I'm used to this behavior. We were having a problem with the bathroom light and I, one day I went in and I flicked the light and the light did not come on. Now, I'm an intelligent person, <laughs> I'm not on the autism spectrum, but what was the behavior that I did? I stood there and very quickly flicked it up and down, up and down, up and oh, down. there you go. Because I was used to, I do this and it works, so I stood there and then I had the thought, I am having an extinction burst with <laughs> the light switch. But quickly I realized it's not working, I need to go do something else to get the light to come on. Right. I need to find a repair person is what right. I need to do. Right. right? But that, so just know there's nothing wrong or strange or weird about your child. It's actually, you know, Normal it's a behavior behavior, yeah. behavior thing. Um, and it is the sign that it's working it's before working. they change their mind. So we don't have to freak. You just go, oh, look at that <laughs> extinction burst. Normally that would freak me out, but I'm okay today. That's um, right. That's but right. please avail yourself of the help that, that Dr. Grand Pichet is talking about. www.ibehavioraltraining.com wonderful site i love how inexpensive oh, the yeah. trainings are and you can you what you it's like between seven dollars and i think the most expensive one is like 22 dollars. yeah you can't buy a book for that right honestly and it's a video where experts are explaining to you and you can watch it and then you can have your significant other watch it and That's then you right. can have your babysitter watch it uh, you know it's a fabulous thing thank you gabe for putting it up there ibehavioraltraining.com it's a fabulous thing. And guess what? It's available at 2 o'clock in the morning no matter which time zone you're in. That's right. Um, you know, it's there 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So sometimes you don't get the child to sleep until 3 o'clock in the morning and you go, what can I learn now? <gasps> Eye behavioral training is and there. And by the me. way, there's also a module about getting your child to sleep. And we're <laughs> going to talk a little bit about that because we had a question that came okay. in sure. uh, on YouTube. We also have a question that came in on Facebook that we're going to get to about a child who uh, has dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism. Yep. But first, we're going to take a break. So stick with us, guys. We're going to be right back after these messages. I'm thrilled to be here. I am here with Dr. Doreen Grampichet, and she is answering your questions in real time, which I love. We had a couple of questions that have come in on our live features on Facebook. Somebody has written in and said, my 11-year-old son with Down syndrome, mild autism, vocal, bilingual, mm -hmm. doesn't like when people laugh. Mm -hmm. Uh, we cannot laugh for any reason when he is around us. He gets upset and yells, don't laugh at me. Mm -hmm. He went to the movie theater and I asked him, how was the movie? And he responded, people were laughing at me and I don't like it. How can we correct this behavior? Whoa. Don't you just want to hug this, this yeah. young man? Yeah. Um, so are we, so I, I don't know. This is one of those that's a little bit hard because I don't know his functioning level. Are, because if he, it's great that he's vocal. I, I'm wondering two things. Let me just share my thoughts. So I, I just, in order to identify what is going on with him, our first assumption is that he really thinks people are laughing at him. That's possible, but it is a little unlikely because if it happens in a movie theater and he still feels like people are laughing at him, uh, it's, I don't know, that's not the same as like somebody standing in front of him. Everybody's looking at a film and so on and so forth. So uh, let's assume that he thinks people are laughing at him. I guess the solution is for you to uh, have two scenarios where you find something that he finds humorous and you actually get him to laugh and then talk to him a lot about what he is laughing at and then ask him if it would be okay for you to laugh at that same thing and help him identify, differentiate between lots of people laughing together at some other thing versus somebody laughing at him. And the only way to do that is to actually get him to laugh, for him to understand humor, and that's a little bit of depth in, in working on that subject. The other thing, I think honestly we have a lesson about laughing with versus at in skills. There yeah, there's something in skills if I remember because this is an issue we've dealt with before. But the other question I have is are we sure that he actually 
um, he is truly thinks, like, is he expressing himself accurately? Because the other al alternative could be the sound of laughter makes him anxious mm -hmm. and he doesn't know exactly how to express that. Mm -hmm. So he says, I don't like it because people are laughing at me. Yeah. Not that he necessarily thinks they're laughing at him, but he says, I don't like the sound of, it's instead of saying, what he really means is, I don't like the sound of laughter, it scares me. So please kind of investigate that possibility as well, because sometimes we do have our children expressing something and it's not really what they intend. Yeah, I, you know, it's so frustrating sometimes because we work so hard to get our kids to communicate and to communicate it's with us. And we feel stuff. like we've reached the promised land when they can, you right. know. Right. I remember always saying I wanted to know what was going on in Jem's head. And then he got to the point where he could communicate with me. Uh, but yeah. I always had to put it through the filter of is that what he really means? Because he would say he was hot when he was cold. Okay, so you know there what I mean? You go, there and, you go. and I had to start to learn that, that that was just what he learned to say, but that really wasn't what he was feeling. What he was feeling That's was exactly cold. right. And I'll tell you what I wish we had. Um, I wish that we had enough time, because from time to time, parents will write something like this in, and I think, wouldn't it be great to have a department that could just make videos for these scenarios? Totally. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't that just be a wonderful thing? Because I remember that there was a problem that my son was having where he kept crashing into people in the classroom. He just... I remember this. Right? Yeah. And, and it was so story. frustrating. And eventually, one of the things that the team asked us to do was to videotape him doing it. But he would not watch himself on videotape. He was, like some kids, like, like that's all they want to watch it's, is the set themselves on video. He hated it. Right. He couldn't stand it. But one day we were watching that show that was done on HBO. I think the name of it was like Peter Goes to Kindergarten. And it was about a boy with Down syndrome who for an entire year they documented him going to kindergarten. And at one point Peter was crashing into the other kids. And, and they would show, they would cut to the kids talking, the neurotypical kids talking about how they felt about it. And they would say, well, I really like Peter, but I don't like it when he crashes into me. It makes me feel angry and sad and then I don't want to play with Peter yeah, right yeah and we were watching it and Jem came in the room with his therapist they were finishing up and he was like what is this right and I said this is about a boy Peter and he watched him and he that was it he right. didn't crash into his friends right. anymore right so I wish that we had a way of all these scenarios like I would love to have this little boy sit down and watch a boy who thinks that they're laughing yeah. um, and that we see them talk through it. I don't know if it would help in this circumstance, but I'm always wanting that. No, it absolutely could help. And, and here's, there's so many things, like this is one of those situations where you really need to identify the function. Like, yeah. I'll give you a third scenario as well, okay. or four, you know, like there's so many different options as well. Like, it is also possible that it, he, this child has said people are laughing at me and has received a large amount of attention. Oh, yeah. And therefore, he's just saying that because he really wants the attention So from you. <laughs> so basically, you need, this is the kind of situation where you need uh, to do what's called a functional behavior assessment and figure out, and this is what a BCBA does, a board certified behavior analyst. It's a process until we find out exactly what is going on with him. Is he like intending to say something else? Is he actually just saying this because he likes the soothing and calming that comes afterwards? Or is he really expressing that he's very distraught uh, by others uh, laughing at him because he's misunderstanding that they're laughing at something else? Each of those scenarios has a different solution. Okay. Now we had a question that came in on YouTube uh, that they want to know, is there a way to address night waking through ABA? My son is six mm -hmm. and started walking around the house mm -hmm. saying he needs to go to the bathroom okay. when grandma stayed with us for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. So the stuff about night, yes, of course there is, but you're going to have to find a team of therapists who are willing to spend the night at your house. And we've done this. I mean, when I was a lot younger and we used to, I used to do therapy, we would actually go and stay at the house and do all sorts of interventions at night. So... The issue with stuff that happens during the night is that, generally speaking, it's, it's very hard because, first of all, everyone else is sleepy, so we sort of don't want to deal with this. You know, I was talking earlier, Shannon, saying that we all of our behaviors have to do with gaining access to or avoiding, 
Let me tell you, that's the truth for us as well, right? I mean, we do, we'll do anything so we can gain access to our bed again. Let me tell Absolutely. you, we'll do anything. Like, we'll allow our kids to come in the bed with us. <laughs> we'll give them food. We'll do anything just because we really want to get back in bed, right? We're tired. Uh, so that's part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that uh, our bodies have a particular system of like getting into a habit when you do it at night. It's very interesting. Uh, it's a, for example, if you eat in the middle of the night, like as babies would get up and we'd give them milk, yeah. it, be, it immediately, very, very quickly, within maybe two days or three days, becomes a learned behavior. Your body will wake up just in order to eat. It's oh. very interesting. Like, let's say the first time you're hungry and someone feeds you, and the second time and the third time, it'll become a habit. Now you have to break the habit. So something happened during that two-week period that grandma was there. Maybe he was looking for you. Maybe it was something that caused him to get out of bed and start walking around the hallways, and now that has become a habit. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to shape it back, essentially. You will need to uh, stay in his room or outside his room, but not allow him to leave his room and walk the hallways. Um, of course, these days, the technology that we have is so good, you can actually put something in the room where you can communicate with him and tell him to go back to bed. Yeah. I don't know his functioning level, so it's very hard for me to advise you on how you can comfort him. But the key is to um, comfort him, but not allow him to start roaming the hallways. It's breaking a habit. It's the exact same thing we do when our children are infants. And unfortunately, you have to go through that again. Yeah. Very, very And then, of tough. course, reinforce him a lot for staying in his room and staying in bed. Yeah. And it works. It does and right work back, we can, we can guide you through it if you start trying it and you hit obstacles. We can try to guide you through that, too. There we go. All right, we're going to take another break, and then we are going to be back with more Ask Dr. Doreen after these mes messages. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live, and we've got one more question here, so I'm going to switch which one I was going to do. Um, uh, a parent wrote in and said, I have an autistic twin and a normal twin. Mm -hmm. They haven't been in the same school since pre-K um, until they started middle school. My normal twin was severely bullied for being, and she says in quotation marks, the, um, the fat screaming R-words brother. My normal twin has also made friends with, quote, unquote, the ugly fat girl. Um, and he has spent the last <sighs> two years being abused at school because of his autistic brother and his friendship with this girl. My uh, normal twin chose to stay at that school for eighth grade to protect his brother. My, goodness. My uh, normal twin's friends will all attend one high school. His autistic brother will have to attend the other high school. He told me that he would go to the high school with his brother to make it easier for, uh, for you and dad and not have his brother have to ride the bus that scares him. It is what it is. And she says that she could use some outside thought on this because it's hard. When I, I can only imagine when you have two kids and you want to make sure you do right by both of them, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's so like, you know, what, what's your take on that? I mean, there's just so many sides to this, you know, and let's try to take the positive, uplifting side, right? I mean, mm -hmm. to, uh, to begin with, my first emotion is I feel bad for the twin, the, the typically developing twin who uh, has to maybe give up on something that he wants. But at the same time, I want to say that, that, that this young uh, boy, right, is yeah. going to become quite an incredible human being, is yeah, already, already quite an incredible yeah. human being, and is going to be one of those people that does a lot in the world. So, you know, he's, he's showing st incredible empathy and caring and um, not just towards his brother, but towards you guys as a family. And uh, what an amazing thing. So, you know, if you end up um, not having another choice and he has to go to the school with his twin, then great, like uh, uh, make, make it a beautiful experience, right? It, yeah. there's, it is a wonderful thing that, that this uh, young uh, man is planning to do, and, and he, he sounds like someone who's a hero. Yeah, absolutely. So celebrate that. I think it's a fantastic thing. 
I also want to say too, I'm sure that the friends are good, but if he has been being bullied all this time, where were the friends and why weren't they, why didn't they have his back? Maybe it's better that he go and get a new group of friends. Yeah. Because, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe they were, that maybe they did have his back, but maybe if we just take one second and talk about, because I hate it when kids are bullied. I just, just hate it. And, and the one thing that I've been looking at over the last couple of years is the bit of uh, research that came out of Santa Barbara that said, here's the one thing that we have found effective across all circumstances that puts bullying in its place. And that is finding a place where the kid has other people like them. And that when they are with like people, that it's they become a tribe. Right. They are stronger, right. and they, and they right. are harder right. to cull from the, you know, just like the yes. wildebeest. You know, if Definitely. they're in the herd, then the bullies don't seek them out. That's absolutely true. And also, uh, things have gotten a lot better. You know, my kids have told me a lot about what goes on in school, and I think. Uh, kids, teenagers, start to show a lot of empathy with more knowledge. Uh, more and more lives are affected by autism, so there's always a few kids who have a sibling on the spectrum, right? It's not like years ago where no one even knew what autism is. So I think one of the things you can do is uh, to actually provide more information to the to the other children in these schools and it's uh let's like i said let's look at all the positives we can do yeah. out of this scenario um and i've always said that it would be amazing for our families for our parents if they go to the schools where their children are and start educating the other children um you know there's it's not people bully and make fun when they have fear um, when they don't know what it is. I don't think any, I mean, unless you're a psychopath, most people don't really enjoy bullying someone. They do it out of fear because they don't know what this other person is all about and yeah. all of that. So I think more information to the, to the other students, teaching them about autism, making them realize that, you know, the individual with autism is, is doing the best he can with all the resources he has. And, I'll, and I, I like to also be able to tell other kids about some of the skills that our kids with autism Absolutely. have because they are not aware of the incredible skills they have either. So Absolutely. And I'm going to cut you off because we got to let you go. But I will say very quickly, there are two people that are on the speaker tour uh, that are on the autism spectrum that talk specifically about bullying, Jesse Saperstein yes. and Carrie Magro. They're both incredible. Maybe that you can get them to come to your school. We have to say goodbye to you yes, in a I'm big sorry, hurry I'm to get you out. Um, but we have incredible videos for you guys to watch. But before you go, I just want to say Merry Christmas, Happy thank New you. Year, and thank, thank you, you for all the things that you do. Thank you very much, Shannon. And the same to you and to all of our viewers. It's it's uh, always wonderful to spend an hour with you guys, and I hope that we've, our show has been able to help you throughout the years, and we look forward to many more shows with you. Have a peaceful, wonderful holiday season, and we'll do a lot of good stuff together in 2019. Absolutely.